Now, the next session is not just a woman's problem, it's working with men on equity and diversity. And I'm particularly keen on this session for a, a, uh, a little experience I had last year. I went to the World Conference of Science Journalists in Seoul, Korea, and was at, on the first day, an invited lunch that was being put on by the female engineers and scientists in Korea for the media, international science journalists. And a fellow named Tim Hunt was asked to give a few comments. Now, I'm not sure if you've heard this story, but Tim Hunt is a very famous Nobel Prize winning scientist from the UK. And he got up and he said, I know I have a chauvinist reputation. And this is a quote, he said, let me tell you about my trouble with girls in the lab. They fall in love with you, you fall in love with them, and they cry when you criticize them. I mean, it was gobsmacking. And I was sitting by a guy, uh, a scientist from the UK, and he turned to me and he said, I never thought I'd hear this in the 21st century. But it was an example of unconscious bias against women. So on that note, I'm very interested <laughs> to hear what our panelists have to say, because I know that some of the sexism we see around us is just plain old-fashioned sexism, and some of it isn't. And one of the people that is going to help tackle this issue, very well uh, credentialed to do so, is Dr. Mark Toner. He's an engineer, management consultant, and company director. And along with uh, Gunella Burroughs, he runs a consultancy called Gender Matters, which provides advice on gender issues and training on mitigating conscious and unconscious bias. He's also the chair of the Gender Equity Working Group of the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, which I keep wanting to call ATSI just for old time's sake. So please welcome Dr. Mark Toner. Thank you, Lee. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like first to talk about ATSI, the Australian um, Academy of Technology and Engineering. You did hear some gender numbers from uh, Susan Pond and Alan Finkel today, so I'll just complete the picture, if you like, so you understand where we as an academy are in the gender space. Uh, ATSI currently has about 830 fellows. Uh, the composition of those fellows is 89% male and only 11% female. But seven years ago, only 6% of our fellows were female. So we've almost doubled um, our female fellowship in seven years. Um, last year, as Alan Finkel said, we um, admitted 30% of new fellows were women, and we've achieved that in recent years, which is, uh, we think, a, a really good target to have, and, uh, and it's great that we can actually achieve that without, if you like, changing the quality of our, of our elected fellows. Um, and for the last three years, our board has comprised 50% women. Now, those numbers aren't particularly good. If you just look at it, stand back, why are only 11% of, of our uh, academy's fellows women? But you need to look, as Alan Finkel said, you need to look at where our fellows come from. Uh, they come from applied science, engineering, and technology, where the uh, proportion of women is extremely low. In fact, the practicing engineering profession in Australia is about 10% female, which is probably by far the worst of any of the major professions. So the the pool in which our, from which our elected fellows come is extremely low in, uh, in women, unfortunately. And we're working hard to uh, increase the, the percent of women in, in ATSI uh, by our policy on, uh, on new fellows. Uh, when was the first woman inducted into um, ATSI? Uh, 40 years ago. So it's been a very slow progress, obviously, to get to our current 11% of females in the, in the fellowship. Um, have we had a female uh, president of ATSI? Not yet, but we're looking forward to that happening. So one of the most um, challenging things, of course, is just to increase the number of female fellows in ATSI. About six years ago, we adopted a gender equity policy. And uh, I'd like to pay particular um, tribute to Dr. Susan Pond for her initiative back in those days for um, getting such a policy um, adopted in ATSI. And I'd also like to pay tribute to um, Dr. Margaret Hartley, the CEO of ATSI, who's here today, in her strong, really strong support for that gender policy um, since it's been adopted. Uh, we revised it last year, uh, and it currently reads, amongst other things, it says the following. 
ATSI will not support or participate in external activities where the organising body has no gender equity policy or where women are not reasonably represented among speakers and panellists unless there are extenuating circumstances. And it's very much like the panel pledge that we heard from Liz Bodrick this morning. So that's a pretty serious step. We're saying our academy will not um, partner with or support any conference or activity or project unless the other parties have their own gender equity policy. And I would suggest all organisations, universities, research institutes and other businesses should have the same policy. Uh, the Gender Equity Working Group, which I chair in ATSI, uh, was formed early last year and our role is to support and drive the objectives of that gender equity policy, including assisting ATSI in partnership with the Australian Academy of Science uh, to support the SAGE program. So I hope you can see that ATSI is taking gender equity seriously. Um, we're working at it hard, but we have a long way to go. So the second thing I'd like to talk about is um, getting back to the title of this session, uh, not just a women's problem, working with men on equity and diversity. It isn't just a woman's problem. I do hear women and men both saying, look, you know, this is a woman's problem, let the women sort it out. Uh, how can they do that when it's largely men running patriarchal systems that cause discrimination against women? So it does require us to get more and more men involved, as, as you've heard other speakers say today. Uh, why don't we see more men in senior leadership positions advocating for gender equity? Well, I, I put men, and what I'm talking about when I talk about men today, I'm also talking about women, but, but uh, let's just talk about men because that's the subject of this session. Um, I think there are three categories that you can put men into. The first category is men who do believe in gender equity. Um, some of them have got there by having um, a daughter or daughters, and they realise that their daughters are just as, uh, or should have just as many equal rights and opportunities as their sons, and that applies to me. That's, that's uh, one of the reasons I'm involved with gender equity. The second um, category, I think, are a lot of men who are, they have an open mind, but they are ignorant of the facts, and that's not their fault. They just have not had any exposure to this issue, and they're not interested because it's not relevant to them. Um, in the first category, there aren't many men, I think, who believe in gender equity. In the second category, um, there are um, quite a lot of people who, quite a lot of men who just literally um, haven't been exposed to it and don't think it's particularly important, but they have an open mind and they can be converted. And then the third category is those men who are consciously and or unconsciously sexist. And I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but I mix with quite a lot of those men. They run senior, uh, sorry, they're in senior positions running big businesses and some universities and some faculties. And um, they are consciously sexist. They actually believe that, that women are not as good as, at men, as men at running things. Men are better at business, at research, at academia, whatever. They believe that seriously. And they're wrong to believe that because there is no evidence that that is true. Men and, men and women are equally capable of doing all those things, but they believe it. And unfortunately, there are a lot of those guys around. They're older white men, right, like me. And I'm just saying that to you because I think it's, you, you know, we need a reality check. These men are running patriarchal systems. The big listed companies um, are run by quite a few men like that. Not all men, but I certainly know company chairmen and company directors of the listed companies of the top ASX 100, 200, and they have those views. That's why there are so few women in senior positions in business. That's the major reason. The men prefer to, to uh, recruit and hire men. Uh, there was a report last week that said that um, in the ASX 100, the top 100 listed companies in Australia, the number of CEOs and deputy CEOs has not increased, sorry, the number, the, the percent of women amongst CEOs and deputy CEOs has not increased in the last five years, which is pretty depressing. So what can we do about that? Well, why are these men, um, who, why do these men have sexist beliefs, I guess is the first question, conscious sexist beliefs. Uh, one reason is uh, privilege. Um, they don't realise the privilege they have because they are white and, um, and in senior positions. And if you're interested in learning more about privilege, there's a really good uh, YouTube clip by Michael Kimmel, K-I-M-M-E-L, on privilege, and he makes the point Privilege is invisible to those who have it. Privilege is invisible to those who have it. The men running big business and maybe universities and research institutions aren't aware of the privilege they have because they are older white men, basically. And therefore, they don't understand that they should adjust for and allow for people who don't have that privilege. That privilege is invisible to them. 
The bigger issue, or the bigger reason I think that these men are sexist, is bias. And we've heard a lot of this morning about unconscious bias. Uh, as a gender consultant, I, uh, we, I do run um, training courses in mitigating cognitive bias. Um, it's, not a, it's not an easy thing to do to reduce or mitigate bias because we are all biased. And certainly, um, it's, you shouldn't fall for the trap of thinking that if you put your staff through unconscious bias training, they will come out with less bias. There's no evidence that that actually is the case. In fact, it can even reinforce bias. But it's a good first step. We certainly advocate putting your staff through unconscious bias training, but that's the first step. There are other things you need to do as well. The second thing you need to do, of course, is address conscious bias. And because these guys who are sexist won't talk about this stuff in front of women, I don't think women generally understand how much conscious sexism there is still amongst the older white men running businesses and universities. And that's unfortunate. But, but these guys are very careful what they say. They've learned not to, not to uh, talk about it too much in front of women. When they meet someone like me, they think I'm sexist just like them and they say some dreadful things to me about women because they think I'm sexist just like them because I look like them. So what can we do? Well, unconscious bias training is a really good first step. Um, secondly, you do need to address um, conscious bias. Unconscious bias training is easy to put um, your staff through, and many universities and the big business, uh, the, big, the big listed companies are all doing it, because no one is to blame with unconscious bias training. Um, the stuff in our unconscious mind is hidden from us. Therefore, we can't be held to blame if we have sexist or racist beliefs in, um, in our unconscious mind. So that's, that's one, that, in a way it's an easy thing to do, but it's a really good thing to do to at least raise awareness of what our unconscious biases could be. Um, the second thing we need to do is actually address conscious bias, which is much more difficult because that might require confrontation with people about their beliefs and their behaviour. And the third thing we need to do is understand some other issues, other gender issues associated with this, like male-female differences. Um, and the, uh, the woman from uh, Edith Cowan University mentioned one about uh, the difference between men and women having confidence to apply for jobs. We need to understand some of those differences as well, which don't apply to individuals, but their generalities about male-female differences. So what can we do to um, get more men involved? Well, there's a number of things. We can learn more about the subject. There's a wealth of information on the internet. Uh, let me just show you this. This is published by Catalyst, uh, which is a, UK organ uh, sorry, a US organisation. Um, and this is uh, titled Engaging Men in Gender Initiatives. There's some really good ideas in here. You can download it from catalyst.org. This is one of four papers on that series of Engaging Men in Gender Initiatives. And they talk about challenging masculine norms, for example. There's all sorts of things we can do. Uh, there's a website called uh, On The Mark, on the MARC.org, uh, which is for men advocating real change in the US. Again, really good information. You can join that site. And there's a, a, a daily um, newsletter in Australia called Women's Agenda, which also has um, interesting articles and research relevant to this area. And you can post your opinions on, on that website. We need to understand the issue of privilege and how much we all have privilege. And we need to, uh, I think, promote that idea of the champions of change that Liz Broderick talked about this morning, both in our sector, our industry sector, and, uh, or academic sector, and in our own organisation. And finally, um, I think we need to be champions of gender equity as individuals. Um, I think we all heard men and some women perhaps making sexist jokes. Um, and of course, one little joke doesn't, uh, doesn't do much damage, but it's a bit like death by a thousand cuts. You hear these over and over again, and they cause cumulative damage. And of course, the problem is if someone makes a sexist joke and you say, I didn't think that was very funny, I don't think you should say things like that, then the retort is always, oh, can't you take a joke? Don't you have a sense of humor? And I think the only answer to that is, if you make sexist jokes, I will assume you're sexist. Or if you make racist jokes, I will assume you're racist. Because we need to stop that happening. It is demeaning to women and it's actually, I think, uh, damaging over time. So, in summary, uh, there's plenty for us all to do to promote gender equity, uh, both in academia and research areas. Um, I, am a, I am optimistic that many more men will become enlightened, uh, learn more about the subject and believe in the principles of gender equity, uh, but we have to keep working at it really hard. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. There are only three words to follow up your talk, stale, pale, and male. This is what we have to worry about. Emma, Professor Emma Johnston. Is that personal? <laughs> no. <laughs> you alerted us to men that look like you, but aren't like you. <laughs> 
and I'm sure Emma Johnston has um, <laughs> dealt a lot with these people. Emma is what I call a pace-setting marine ecologist and ecotoxicologist. She's an underwater trailblazer. There's no two ways about that. She's an expert advisor to industry and government and television presenter for the BBC Foxtel series, The Coast Australia. I'm sure many of you have seen it. She's recently been appointed Pro Vice Chancellor Research at the University of New South Wales, which is proving she is also an above ground trailblazer. And she's the inaugural recipient of the Nas Nancy Mills Medal for Women and the Australian Academy of Science. Please welcome Professor Emma Johnston. Thank you, everybody. You probably don't recognize me without my wetsuit. Um, thanks for the lovely introduction. I am a professor and a newly minted Pro Vice Chancellor of Research. <laughs> Which really just, thank you, thank you. It really just means I am getting quite long in the tooth, uh, at least as far as my students and my kids are concerned. What I realised, thinking back on this long and illustrious career the other day for the purposes of this talk, was I have never once reported to a female director boss or supervisor throughout that entire career. So it is my great pleasure to join you today uh, for my first go at telling men what they can go and do. <laughs> I jest, of course, kind of. Uh, <laughs> so gender equity is not just a woman's problem and nor are the benefits of increased gender equity only a woman's blessing. Men stand to gain enormously from increased gender equity in society. They do so through increased psychological and physical health. Uh, there are the actual gap in the age expectancy reduces as gender equity increases. They have more fun with their families and their kids. Uh, their companies outperform other companies, if you believe all the correlations. And as a scientist, I need to look a little bit closer at some of that data. There's less partner violence and men are no longer constrained by the really strict gender norms that are particularly evident in Australian society and have been at play this week on the television. Uh, so the key message from me today, which the audience, um, most of the audience will clearly need to relay to the men because they couldn't be here, they're looking after the kids I think, um, is that Men and all of us need to mainstream gender equity. And because it's hard to remember, I'm going to shorten that to manstreaming gender equity. And manstreaming gender equity is a bit like mansplaining, only bigger yes. and better. So manstreaming gender equity means building gender equity into all of our processes, policies and culture so that it becomes the new norm, business as usual. And some of this is relatively easy because, as you've just heard and throughout the morning you've heard, a lot of it has been done before. Mainstreaming gender equity is up on the web. There are documents, there are guidelines, how to write the business case, what, what the key messages should be for every aspect of staff, what the key policy changes are required. There are ways of documenting the data, reviewing the data, reflecting on your progress. It's all available. We just need to do it. As Susan Pond said, designing out gender bias from the systems and processes is not only very effective, it's actually much more rapid than changing individuals' minds. However, and it's not rocket science, it's more like baking a cake, but what I wanted to talk to you about today was the harder stuff, the rocket science. And that's because in order for us to move forward rapidly in introducing those changes to policies, procedures and practices, the culture also needs to change. And that's actually much more difficult to do because it requires the recalibration of worldviews, not just men's worldviews, uh, but women's worldviews, everyone's worldviews. But the po most powerful and the most privileged men must carry the burden of leading the mainstreaming of gender equity, particularly when it comes to changing the culture 
of their organisations because they are the ones making most of the decisions and they are the ones leading the culture of the organisation. Manstreaming means shifting cultural norms, shifting baselines, accepting that gender bias does exist and I get a lot of feedback from a lot of senior men that indicates they don't accept that gender bias exists. It means discussing gender inequity, calling out sexism, calling out harassment, recognising and removing implicit bias, sometimes called unconscious bias, and weakening the impact of negative stereotypes. Unfortunately, in some sectors, we're lagging behind greatly. And uh, actually, the university and the higher education sector is, is well advanced in some respects, so that's good. But it does sound enormously tricky, doesn't it? So you're lucky I'm here to help. Um, it's the latest thing, woman-splaining, man-streaming. Uh, but all, we, all I'm going to do today is talk about a few things that I've... They're based on the experiences that I've had, that I... Changes to culture, easy to remember, things not to do, which will enable a faster, more rapid adoption of gender equity language, uh, gender equity norms, or gender equality norms. How do we change, how do we recalibrate? especially if you are a middle-class white male or one of the member of the dominant society. Like seven out of eight of Australia's current GO8 vice-chancellors, 85% of Australia's CEOs, 70% of Australia's DVCRs and PVCRs. If you've had quite a restricted worldview, you're less likely to have experienced bias or discrimination. Not unlikely, but less likely. And this doesn't mean that your experiences are invalid. It simply means they're not comprehensive and they represent a form of ignorance. They can certainly create apathy, and that's what I see a lot of. And the absence of experience of discrimination has been used as evidence to deny the existence of discrimination. And that's what should be avoided. As a privileged person, and I count myself as one of those privileged people, we can educate ourselves very easily these days. We can read studies that document gender bias and provide data to help us recalibrate our baselines and recalibrate the metrics of merit. There are even annotated bibliographies of all of the studies that have been done on the web. So it's made easy for us. We can take those implicit bias tests to see where our biggest problems lie. And there are qualitative tools. Take social media. Last week, for example, a new hashtag appeared called hashtag no woman ever. It was a darkly humorous recount of everyday street harassment that women encounter, where women jokingly um, wrote about how that harassment had changed their mind about the suitability of the harasser as <laughs> the next date. It, it was disturbing, but for women reading it, it all sounded true because many of us have experienced many of those harassments. For men, if you read it without vile, if you read it without reaction, it would help to recalibrate your sense of what is likely to be a true story when you hear about it on, in the workplace. And so in that sense, reading all those blogs and hashtags and revealing accounts helps us to understand that the experiences that we have are only a limited set. And that is something that I highly recommend. So the four Ds of denial, I could go on and on and on, but the lemma has, has appeared. Um, it's first, don't deny. The mainstreaming gender equity strategy when you hear a story that you're not quite sure is true and you really haven't experienced it before, is to first listen, second, accept. Third, sometime later down the track, if you really need to go and find the evidence, do so and do so yourself. Don't ask for it from the person who is pronouncing their um, harassment or their discrimination. The second one is don't diminish. If you hear yourself saying, it's possible you're making too big a deal out of it, you're probably wrong because everybody has a sense of how big a deal that particular event has been. And when you have been sensitised to discrimination by a lifetime of experiences, you actually become allergic to the next event and it means much more than it would be to someone who had a much thicker skin. The third D is don't defend. If you find yourself using the phrase, 
I'm sure they didn't mean it that way, uh, then you're probably in trouble. If you're defending a case of discrimination, think about who the powerful person is in that particular case. Defend the one who is not powerful, not the one who is powerful, and then you'll be in the right space. The fourth recommendation is don't derail the discussion. So they're my four Ds. We all like to engage in communication. We all want to empathise with the person who we're speaking with. So this is one of the trickier ones to avoid. If someone gives you an example of bias within the workplace and you say, oh, really? Well, you would not believe what happened to me. Unless your situation is really as serious and the consequences as offensive, then by all means offer your own embarrassment, but very quickly move back to the substantive issue because otherwise you will de de derail the discussion. In conclusion, if men are to mainstream or manstream gender equity, their heart must be in the right place and they must value fairness, but that is not sufficient to ensure success. We know we've got to put the policies and practices in place that reduce bias and promote equality and diversity. We know what those policies and practices are and they are hardly rocket science. The rocket science is in the recalibration of our worldviews so that we can have those important discussions and avoid denial, dismissal, defence and derailment. The rocket science is in learning to listen to very quiet voices and making voice, um, space for those voices at work. The rocket science is in recognising and addressing our own implicit biases and our own limited experiences. And they say that travel broadens the mind, so what mainstreaming men can do is to leave their comfortable universe and step into a female rocket scientist's shoes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Emma. I really like your four Ds. Although they, uh, when you started listing them, I was thinking of the four stages of death. You know, <laughs> but maybe there, there's, there's an appropriate relationship there. Our final speaker in today's session, after which we will have time for questions, is Dr. Mar is uh, uh, P uh, Professor Peter Koopman. No sense going back to Mark Toner. We've already heard from him. Um, and what I think is particularly interesting about Peter Koopman is that he is, it makes him so relevant to this discussion, is that he is the co-discoverer of the sex male determining gene in the Y chromosome. Hard to imagine anybody more appropriate to <laughs> dig down into what's really going on with men, equity, and diversity. Now, obviously, he's a geneticist. He's a senior principal research fellow at the Institute for Molecular Bioscience, the University of Queensland. He's a member of the Council of Australian Academy of Science and co-chairs its Equity and Diversity Task Force. Peter has spearheaded efforts to encourage broader recognition of merit in the academy. Please welcome Professor Peter Koopman. PowerPointing. Thanks very much, Lee. Um, look, as you've heard, my uh, research topic is uh, sex, and so perhaps I'm in a good position to answer the question that came up just before about the difference between sex and gender. So sex is really about the biology of the differences between males and females, whereas gender is really a psychosocial construct that deals with uh, a person's perception of masculinity or femininity. So, in fact, a lot of what we're dealing with when we talk about gender is really about sex. It's just the sad thing is, and I've experienced this in my research career, is that the word sex is very awkward. People tend to think of the action uh, of sex rather than the concept of sex. And so that's perhaps why a lot of, uh, why a lot of these issues gets la get labelled as gender issues rather than sex issues. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here because, as you've heard, uh, I co-chair the Academy of Sciences uh, Task Force on Gender and Equity, and I co-chair that with Sue O'Brien. And so what I'd like to talk to you about today is uh, some of how sex and gender, uh, uh, sorry, equity and diversity play out in the Academy of Sciences. A lot of that is to do with uh, issues of how we elect our fellows 
Uh, the Academy of Science uh, elects its fellows based on the principle of scientific excellence. And it's important, I think, uh, that we think about how we, uh, how we assess uh, excellence uh, in the Academy. The Academy has currently about 500 fellows and we elect 20 approximately new fellows each year. Now, this is a photograph of the intake of fellows for 2016. So just by way of audience participation, what do you notice about this photograph? <laughs> Sorry? It was daytime. It was daytime. That's, <laughs> that's good. Anything else? All right, well, look, let me give you some clues. I think you know the answer to this, is that uh, amongst this group, there are 15 men uh, and six women. And the age distribution is shown at the bottom. There's certainly a predominance for uh, men in their 50s and 60s. Now, uh, some may take this as an encouraging sign, some may take this as a depressing sign, but uh, whichever way you take it, significant progress has certainly been made uh, along the history of the Academy of Science. It was established in 1954. There were an initial cohort of 64 fellows elected into the Academy. And surprise, surprise, they were all men. Over the decades, uh, typically about 100 new fellows have been added in each decade. And these are the statistics for each decade. As you can see, it was fairly slim pickings for women until things started to move a little bit in the 80s when the proportion of women uh, inducted into the, into the fellowship began to increase. Uh, as you've heard in previous talks, uh, 2013 was our earthquake moment, a year in which zero women fellows were elected into the academy. And that obviously uh, caused great consternation and caused a few changes, such that in the following three years, 2014, 15 and 16, the proportion of women inducted into the academy rose dramatically to approximately 40%. We're now in a situation where we have uh, about 500 fellows a total of 60 of whom are women, which is a 12% uh, rate. Now, uh, this graph also shows the age distribution of the fellowship, and there are a couple of interesting things that pop out from these graphs. First is that only 4% of the fellowship is under the age of 50, 4%. Conversely, 66%, two-thirds of the fellowship, are above 65, what we consider in Australia to be the retiring age. 50%, half of the fellowship, are above the age of 70. Now, this demographic is not accounted alone by the ageing of the population. Uh, it's, it's also due to the fact that the age of uh, fellows at election is steadily increasing over the years. So over the last 40 years, the mean age of election has, has increased from 50 to around 55. And I very cheekily extrapolated that to suggest that in <laughs> another 300 years, the average age of election will be approximately 100. <laughs> Never let scientists loose with statistics. Now, uh, a, a, a large part of understanding how the situation has come to be and what the, uh, the future situation is likely to become revolves around understanding our election processes and these are what they are. Uh, every year around 150 nominations are assessed by 13 different sectional committees. Sectional committees each focus on a specific sub-discipline of science. These 150 are a combination of new nominees and existing nominees. So the sectional committees each consider 10 to 20 uh, nominations and recommend, uh, each recommends uh, two to three uh, shortlisted candidates to council for further consideration. So about 40 uh, candidates go up to council. Council has a look at all of those nominations and tries to uh, assess between disciplines and comes up with a list of 20 who are then uh, able to celebrate their election to the academy. Now, there are a number of clear uh, barriers to diversity in this pipeline, which does, I have to admit, look as if it was designed by men for men. Now, uh, 
First is the pool. I don't know if you can read that at the back, but that says the pool. Now, um, the type of nominations that are received clearly depends a little bit on the demographic of the pool of people who are eligible to be uh, nominated for, for fellowship. These tend to be senior academics. Clearly, there's an overwhelming gender imbalance amongst senior academics in the pool. Secondly is the principle of like chooses like. As you've seen, the overwhelming majority of fellows are men. It is fellows who nominate new potential fellows, and therefore, the new nominees are more than likely to also be men, and perhaps of uh, a, a, an older age demographic also. Um, thirdly is that both the sectional committees and council uh, assess merit and opportunity. And a number of the indicators of merit that are conventionally relied upon could be said to uh, predispose for election of men and perhaps older men. One thing, for example, that we rely on to some extent is the amount of overseas conference presentations that people have given. Clearly, uh, that's going to be limited if uh, a person is trying to look after, let's say, a young family. Um, and finally, there's the issue of unconscious bias, which we've heard about, and that plays into these decisions also. And so perhaps a combination of all of these barriers leads to the situation that we currently have of a predilection for electing uh, older white men. What are we doing about this? Well, we're doing a number of things. Oh, Mr. Lima has appeared already. I better speed up. Um, in the last couple of years, the, institute, the Academy has uh, instituted a proactive nomination system of discipline nomination, nominating groups. Uh, these are groups of fellows who are charged with going out and, and specifically looking for potential new fellows who are diversity candidates. This uh, negates the uh, problem of the imbalances of the pool and negates the problem of like chooses like. These, these groups are specifically charged with looking for diversity candidates to add to the nominations. Secondly, we have recently rejigged the selection criteria, hopefully to redefine uh, uh, what we're looking for in terms of merit uh, and also take into consideration uh, opportunity as a major criterion um, to, to help balance things out and also uh, members of council and sectional committee chairs are now given unconscious bias training, which uh, we hope is, is helpful to produce a more uh, balanced output. As you've heard, recently the Academy has taken steps to institute a diversity and equity reference group. Uh, I and uh, Sue O'Brien uh, 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 um, chair a task force tasked with setting this up, uh, and we hope that this will also help um, the purpose of the Diversity and Equity Reference Group is to promote the principles of uh, uh, diversity of gender, ethnicity, age, geographical distribution and scientific disciplines. We recognise, of course, that there are many other types of diversity, but these are the places that we're starting. And in terms of equity, we are trying to promote the principles of inclusion, equal opportunity, fairness tra and transparency into academy policies and procedures. So, uh, in summary then, I think we're seeing positive signs of change within the Academy. Uh, these are great signs, but I think there are, uh, there's an enormous potential for further change. What we would like to achieve, I think, is, is changes in the Academy that go hand in hand with systemic changes in society. Uh, what we want to avoid is some sort of tokenism where we are uh, appointing diversity candidates purely because they are underrepresented. It would be much better if the pool of candidates can change in a positive way. And that's obviously the theme of this meeting. Uh, universities have a very important part to play in making sure that uh, women and other uh, diversity uh, groups are well represented uh, in, in, uh, senior, among senior academics. Uh, the student population, the high schools, primary schools, the way uh, girls are brought up right from the beginning, I think, will help to feed uh, a more healthy pipeline of greater representation. Uh, getting back to my research, which is on sex development, obviously I know as well as anybody that males and females are equally capable. So the challenge ahead is to make sure 
that uh, females are given uh, equal opportunity, equal opportunity to, to achieve their potential and equal opportunity to demonstrate their excellence. Thank you very much. Uh, a quick question for Mark. You mentioned before the panel started that you could add to the discussion of gender versus sex. Do you have a couple of comments there? Uh, look, no, I'm happy. Very, I'm very happy with Peter's um, explanation of that, that, uh, that sex is the biological um, name for uh, our makeup, our, our chromosomal makeup, and gender is the, um, the, um, the image of ourselves that we have as either a man or a woman. Um, and the way society sees us. So um, I'm very happy with that, that general difference, as Peter explained it. It did occur to me, of course, that I call myself a gender consultant, and I thought, hell, I would not want to call myself a sex consultant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we've clarified this. <laughs> and the gentleman in the back? Tim West, Charles Sturt University, but I'm actually part of the ACT uh, regional group. And one of the things that we've been thinking about, and actually it's redolent of today as well, I think we have fewer than 20% males in the, in the room today. It's something which we've been saying is very important for everybody. My question is, how do we deal with the naysayers? What do the panel say, especially from Mark's talk? I mean, I'm interested in actually getting people into a room who actually are passive aggressive or actually aggressive against what we're trying to do rather than trying to preach the converted. Mm. What is it that we do to take that forward? Because I think we want to do it, we don't entirely know what the best strategy might be. Mark? Well, look, as I said, and it's a good question obviously, um, I think there are a large number of men who just do not understand what this is all about because they haven't had to in the past and maybe now that they're exposed perhaps to gender issues in their organisation, um, they uh, aren't comfortable in dealing with it, so they keep away from it. And therefore, they don't deal with it properly. They're the people, they're the men that we need to, I think, talk to and, and give the, the right arguments um, to them about why gender equity is important and why it's the only fair approach. The guys who I put into that third category of, of guy, men who are consciously sexist, I don't think there's any chance we will persuade them to change their mind. You know, they're older men who are firmly of this view. They might have children, they might, they might have daughters, they might have wives, um, partners, whatever. That doesn't change their view whatsoever. It's just like if you try to change somebody's view about which political party they want to vote for or which football team they want to vote for, they're not going to change. So I think what we need to do, unfortunately, is work on the men who can change, um, that, that second category I talked about, and wait for the guys in the third category to retire and die out. <laughs> But I, just adding to that, I mean, there's, there's been some very effective change in that group through peer pressure and through competition, and that's part yep. of the way in which SAGE and other organisations that get that critical saturation point are effectively working. And, and it's not just on gender equity that that has been extremely effective. So, yes, in part, you've, you've got a real struggle of changing the individual's mind. I do think that some of the... There is no excuse anymore that the information is available, the world is a lot smaller. You know, you, you could hold people to account for not knowing the data behind this. Mm. Uh, so that might be a shaming <laughs> technique. Mm. Um, but, you know, there are a few hard cases still around. And you've got to remember, their mindset is calibrated to when they grew up. So you've also got a generational change yes. happening yes. there, and it doesn't always come easy. Peter. Just wanted to add that in my experience and sitting on a lot of committees, it's not always the men who need to be got on board. No. Mm. Uh, it's quite often the case that women are uh, <coughs> extremely harsh on other women candidates being considered. And there was a question over to my left. Therese Donlevy from Ansto. Sorry, that's a bit loud. No, it's good. Um, Professor Koopman, you mentioned that in the academy selection process, you redefined your selection criteria and your definition of excellence. I'm wondering whether part of the barriers to female progression is that the definition of excellence isn't pitched correctly for what we're really good at, and that that may need some work in addition to the procedures, policies and processes. Couldn't agree more. Um... So let me just try to think of some of the changes that we've made. There's, there's an increased, uh, I mean, we haven't changed the selection criteria completely, but we are slowly redesigning them. Uh, there's been a greater emphasis, for example, on uh, mentorship, which is traditionally, I think, something that women are better at than men. 
uh, for example. Just Question to, um, to my left again. I just have to add a point about oh, please do. university rankings, because university rankings are driving a lot of competitive behaviour between universities, and they need to have a, we need to have a serious look at university rankings. I mean, when you've got a ranking that gives you a 30% bonus if you've got a Nobel Prize winner, yeah. And then we know that, you know, that's not the be-all and end-all of innovation, science and knowledge exchange. You know that we might be being pushed in quite bizarre directions simply by external rankings that are being run by commercial agencies, really. And internal rankings as well. Yeah. Within the university system or the institution. Mm. Yes. Um, Claire Braun again. Um, I really love the ATSI stuff. I've done that exercise. Um, sorry, the um, academy data, and it really speaks to the fact that without the data, you cannot move forward from any point. And I love Emma's point too about the hierarchical rankings and all of those issues. I think those structural issues as are, are absolutely critical. But the point I, I would also make, and and it's a comment. Um, I get very tired of people saying women are hard on women. Yeah, they are sometimes, but you know what? Women are hard on men, men are hard on men, and men are hard on women as well. So we have to be really careful when we suddenly put this extra standard of behaviour on women that suddenly they have to also be nice to all of the other women. I'm not saying you should be nice to everybody, just by the way. But we suddenly say that it is the role of women to help other women um, and yet we don't expect the same standards from others. So we just really need to be careful when we look at the language around that. And, we sudden, and you'll suddenly get a whole lot of men sitting on panels saying, yeah, but you know what? I know women that aren't very nice to women as well. Yeah, well, you know, I know dogs with four legs. Great. So in what, what is the relevance? So you just I just think we have to be really careful when we make those kind of sweeping statements. And AD? Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment at the Institute. Could you identify yourself oh, for yeah. the rest of the audience, please? Sorry, A.D. Patterson from ANSTO. Um, uh, I just wanted to comment perhaps on uh, some higher level symbols of change than the sort of individual migration model into academies. Uh, I was fortunate to go through the transition in South Africa where there was uh, two academies, uh, or two and a half academies. Uh, they were separated by language. Uh, there was a massive transformation required in terms of the, the ethnic composition of the academy and so on. And the way that that was resolved uh, was actually to persuade a lot of people who were above a certain age, and I forget what it was, I think it was probably 70, that they would become a different category of member, which opened up the bottom of the, uh, oh, yeah. uh, the, the, the pile to a whole lot of new members to come in who had been excluded for all sorts of weird reasons. And my assumption is that we're not just dealing with an improvement model, but an exclusion model. And we had a very uh, open conversation about that in the South African setting. And once we, we talked about systemic historical exclusion, it was possible to talk about a new pipeline and a new way of actually making it more inclusive. The other thing that systemically has been done in a number of uh, younger countries, and Australia in science terms is an older country, um, is to create youth academies of science so that you model in your youth academy, what you would like to see in your ancient, uh, older academy. <laughs> um, uh, and and, and by, by modeling what you want to see, you change the behaviors of the next generation because they are, they are part of a process of showing what transformation looks like in a society. So I think we should aim not just to, to have a, a trickle uh, down or trickle across type of model. I think it takes too long. The age one was interesting. Um, and so I think that we, we might want to reflect as we become more experienced in this area and as we learn more about it, uh, to look at some stronger levers of change that might be more institutional in nature. And I'd be interested in the comments of the people on the panel. Peter? Uh, no, I don't have much to add to that. I, I'm fully in agreement of that. We've, we've considered a, a so-called junior academy, but um, there are problems around that, whether that's considered patronising to some, uh, I'm not sure, but we can certainly look at that. Any other comments? Sorry, can I just add that you did have the Early and Mid-Career Research Forum? The Early and Mid-Career Research Forum is very much a youth academy. Um, the Australian Academy of Science established that in 2011. Nicola, do you want to stand up and just... Ah, there you are. Right here is the chair of the EMCR Forum, the national voice of tomorrow's future scientific leader. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. <laughs> um, can I Don't forget the squeaky cheeseburger or squeaky lemur yeah. will be at you if you go on too long. No, that's okay. I just want to add 
thank you to, to Maggie for um, bringing up the EMCR forum and where we fall under the banner of the Academy of Science. Um, we did consider putting together a young academy, as was just mentioned, but the reason we steered away from that was because we wanted to stay an advocacy group and we thought it was just another model of an elite system that we didn't really want to <coughs> fall into the trap of. So we decided to, to keep it very broad and to keep advocacy happening for EMCRs. So that was kind of to answer the question of why we don't have a young academy at the moment. Thank you. Yep. And the question in the back? Um, Hetty Bryant from Charles Sturt University. I'm the manager of diversity and equity and I'd like to commend you, Mark, for writing your, into your policy that you won't partner with other organisations that don't have a policy. Um, I'm very lucky to have the chair of the um, Equity and Diversity Committee here with me today, so I think we might take that forward and do the same thing. And I'd like to throw out the challenge to all of the other institutions here today to actually try and do that. I know that Unisuper has done that with mining and done it really successfully, so it's a, a bit like divesting, and I think it's a probably very easy thing that we can do. So thank you very much for that. Could I just say thank you for that comment. Um, our gender equity policy is on the ATSI website if you want to lift the words directly. Oh. And a question or comment down front here. Thank you. I'm Deborah Schofield. I'm from the University of Sydney, the Garvin and the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. I just wanted to ask Peter, are you aware that Academy membership is in fact taken into account for a track record with NHMRC, uh, at least for program grants, I'm aware, um, because I've been on the panel the last two years. And so if women find it almost impossible to become a member, then that impacts on their track record, which gives them less chance to win grants and less chance to have a research program that may one day, if men let them get into the academy, actually become members. Sure, thanks for those comments. I mean, I think that makes it all the more important what we're doing. Any other responses to that? Pathways? Another question to my left. Uh, yes, this is just further to that one. Liz Sullivan from UTS. I'm interested in, you showed us the statistics from the 1950s that there seems to be only around 20 per year, that with the massive increase in PhDs and people working in the research workforce, why we only have eligible or 20 people a year being admitted, it seems to me a very low number. Uh, that has increased, I believe, in the, in, the, in the earlier years, it was 10 or 12 admitted per year. Uh, that has successively increased, I think, through 14, 16 to 20. Uh, it's, it's still debated whether it could or should go higher than that. Uh, there's certainly a lot of people in favour of increasing the intake beyond 20, but that, that we continue to have those conversations. We have time for one final question to my right. It's Chris Gunson from Edith Cowan University. Um, again, it's almost a, a comment, but thank you, Peter. Um, the whole issue of merit, accomplishment profiles, allowing for opportunity. Just to say to the group that the NHMRC are currently undertaking a significant review of their grant program. It's about to go on a national roadshow basis consulting in all states. At the heart of it um, are issues around grant success and researchers and researcher profiles that they're trying to get some sort of shift in. They're interested in diversity um, and I believe that some of these issues about how merit is assessed for grant success will be front and centre. But I have to say I'm sitting on that panel and I can't hear a lot of, at the moment, creative ideas about how the structure will change to deliver that. So for those of you here that have ideas about that, please get along to the consultations and make your views known. Thank you. Yeah, and just, Oh, yes, please. Could I just make a comment? You mentioned the word merit. Um, and a lot of people seem to think that merit is an objective um, criterion. Um, I talk to senior management who say, we don't have bias in our organisation because we recruit and promote on merit. And what they don't realise is that merit is incredibly subjective. My view of merit of an applicant is going to be different from your view of the merit of an applicant. And so merit is, a, is really subject to bias. It isn't an objective um, criterion at all. So we just have to be careful when we say proudly we promote on merit. That doesn't mean much. Thank you.